Well, good day and welcome back to the Johnson Space Center for today's mission status briefing on Atlantis's flight to the International Space Station. Two spacecraft joined as one in orbit today and with us to discuss all of the day's activities is the STS-132 lead sh space shuttle flight director, Mike Serafin. Mike. Well, good afternoon and uh, thank you for tuning in to flight day three of the, of the uh, flight of the space shuttle Atlantis to the International Space Station during the STS-132 mission. Uh, today has been a highly successful day. The uh, crew of Atlantis is now at the International Space Station. We have a total of 12 crew members uh, working together in an international effort to uh, install the ROSFET module uh, two days from now on flight day five, as well as uh, to perform three spacewalks. Uh, earlier today, uh, Commander Ken Ham and his uh, crew of six veteran astronauts uh, started their day uh, roughly 40 nautical miles from the International Space Station and performed a series of rendezvous burns uh, to approach the International Space Station. Uh, we've got some video footage of that, uh, including the uh, docking and hatch opening that I'd like to show you. Uh, the first piece of that uh, footage is a bright star on the horizon. That is Atlantis viewed from the International Space Station and the plume that you can see uh, coming out from Atlantis uh, was seen from 40 miles away during a two engine burn uh, to raise the altitude. Uh, here, here you can see Atlantis approaching the International Space Station as it flies over the Andes Mountains. Uh, during the approach, we performed the uh, backflip maneuver where we took uh, roughly 400 digital stills uh, from the International Space Station of Atlantis and its heat shield. Uh, here you can see a view of the International Space Station and its docking uh, configuration. And then uh, the final approach of Atlantis, uh, the uh, docking occurred at 928 Central over the South Pacific. Uh, shortly after the uh, docking, the crew jumped into a series of procedures to uh, structurally mate the two vehicles. They closed the uh, hooks and then performed a series of leak checks to ensure that uh, there were no leaks into the vacuum of space. Uh, shortly after those procedures were performed, they opened the hatches at around 1118 Central today. Uh, the two crews joined as one and uh, were happy and greeted each other. Uh, all the crew members on, board the, uh, on both uh, Atlantis as well as the International Space Station are doing well and uh, are busily getting into their uh, activities today. Uh, later uh, today, uh, shortly after uh, this press conference, the uh, crew of uh, Atlantis and the International Space Station, specifically Pierce Sellers and Tracy Caldwell Dyson, will uh, use the space station's robotic arm to pull the uh, cargo carrier out of the shuttle's payload bay and install that on the uh, mobile transporter on the International Space Station. That'll set us up for the first of our three planned spacewalks. Uh, during that spacewalk, they'll take the uh, spare communications antenna tomorrow off of, the, uh, off of the cargo carrier and install that to its permanent and final location on board the uh, International Space Station. Uh, they'll also take the uh, enhanced ORU temporary platform, which is a, uh, a platform that keeps uh, spare uh, hardware uh, warm uh, during uh, robotic activities to remove and replace them. They'll install that on the uh, space station as well. Uh, later this evening, they'll uh, transfer their uh, suits over to the International Space Station. Uh, Steve Bowen and Garrett Reisman will set up uh, in a camp out to uh, purge nitrogen out of their bloodstream in a uh, reduced pressure environment in the International Space Station airlock. Uh, they'll stay there overnight, and then in the morning they'll wake up and uh, perform their first spacewalk. Uh, there'll also be a lot of robotic activity to support that spacewalk by transferring parts uh, to and from the International Space Station. We expect some spectacular footage as Garrett rides the uh, International Space Station's arm uh, above the International Space Station and looks down on Atlantis. Um, we had a, uh, a number of events that uh, have occurred over the last day that I'd like to talk about and update you on. Uh, there was a debris avoidance maneuver that the International Space Station was uh, potentially going to perform. Uh, late last evening, the uh, Space Station team, uh, along with our counterparts in U.S. STRATCOM, uh, determined that the debris avoidance maneuver was not uh, necessary and we did not have to lower the altitude of the International Space Station. And as a result, during the docking and the approach today, uh, we did not have to modify the uh, planned trajectory of Atlantis. Uh, Ken Ham and the uh, crew of Atlantis did an outstanding job uh, flying to the International Space Station. Uh, the uh, debris uh, passed uneventfully by the International Space, Space Station and the shuttle Atlantis about an hour after docking today at a range of roughly 16 kilometers. 
Uh, we uh, also continued to work through a number of uh, uh, methods to gather the uh, heat shield information and imagery that we did not uh, fully capture during uh, yesterday's uh, planned inspection of Atlantis's heat shield. Uh, as you recall, we had a problem with the uh, boom and the ability to gimbal the uh, sensors on the end of the boom. Uh, we uh, performed a, uh, a backup method of, of inspection and we did not gather all the planned uh, imagery during that inspection, uh, specifically the areas along the, the side of the nose uh, called the chine where the, the wing merges out of the nose of Atlantis, and then uh, on the top side of the reinforced carbon carbon on uh, the port wing. Uh, we're uh, looking at options to go off and gather that imagery. Uh, during the, uh, the pitch maneuver earlier today, we augmented the two planned uh, crew members with a third crew member, Tracy Caldwell Dyson, and she did an outstanding job of gathering uh, images of the top side of the reinforced carbon carbon using a, a digital still camera with an 800 millimeter lens. All of the images, uh, again, roughly 400 uh, digital still images are on the ground and uh, currently being assessed and analyzed by our uh, team of analysts. And uh, we expect uh, those folks to meet later this evening to decide whether we need to go off and gather additional imagery to clear Atlantis's heat shield or if we have everything that we need. Um, we're looking at uh, backup methods to use the shuttle's robotic arm uh, in the event that uh, some of those activities uh, do require uh, arm support from the, uh, from the shuttle. And uh, the team is off uh, building the, uh, the procedures and uh, if necessary, we can send those to the crew of Atlantis and have those uh, executed no earlier than flight day five. Uh, the activities that we have ahead of us uh, tomorrow with our first spacewalk as well as the uh, installation of the ROSVAT module are gonna be performed as planned. So any changes to the uh, mission timeline or the mission plan will occur after uh, the uh, miniature research module is installed on flight day five. Uh, we also had a, uh, a number of smaller uh, systems anomalies with Atlantis today. There was a, uh, a pressure regulator on the uh, left uh, maneuvering engine that uh, is used to raise the, uh, the uh, orbit of Atlantis. Uh, we had a, a little bit higher pressure come out of the uh, regulator than we normally see, so we swapped to a, a backup regulator and the engine worked just fine for the rest of the rendezvous. Uh, we also have a, uh, a thruster, uh, one, uh, one on the uh, left side in the down firing direction that uh, potentially has a heater that's failed off. The uh, jet's getting a little cooler than it normally would if the heater were acting normally. Uh, so we're not quite sure if the heater is controlling to a slightly lower uh, set point or if it's uh, completely failed off. Uh, the folks are off looking at it. We don't expect either the, uh, the regulator problem that I mentioned or the heater problem on the thruster to be of any consequence uh, with the mission. And uh, we're, uh, we're proceeding again as planned over the next couple of days. So with that, uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Okay, we have reporters here in Houston, also reporters on our phone bridge, and we'll start here in the front with Bill. Uh, Bill Hart with CBS. I'm, uh, Mike, unclear about what didn't get done on the port wing. Um, because you, I know Tracy took, I think they said 149 pictures today with the big lens, but what else do they need to do and, and, and why wouldn't you just do it on flight day five if, if you don't have a focused inspection? Yeah, the uh, method, the backup method that we used to inspect the heat shield uh, yesterday uh, was a fixed sensor on the boom. So the, the boom is, uh, only has a view of the wing surface uh, when you're able to position the arm in that direction. And uh, we just simply could not position the arm in the right uh, orientation with the boom because of the fixed sensor to gather all the port wing imagery. Uh, it's, it's just a, a limitation of the robotic uh, arm and, and the way that all the joints move together. Uh, so today we, again, took some imagery of the top side of the reinforced carbon carbon on the port wing. Uh, Tracy did a great job of gathering that imagery. And right now we may have everything that we need. Uh, the imagery team is off looking at that and uh, we'll let them decide whether we need to gather any additional uh, imagery to clear the heat shield uh, over the next day or so. And uh, if so, we'll go off and get that. And on uh, docking and, and the Torva and final approach, how, how did Ham do on uh prop management and all that sort of thing. It looked pretty clean. 
Yeah, uh, we knew that we had an, an excess of uh, propellant on this mission uh, just due to the time of year that we're launching and the uh, weight of all of the, uh, the payloads that we were flying up. Uh, so we knew that we had a little more propellant available for the rendezvous in the, in the entire mission. Uh, but uh, Ken Ham did, a, did an outstanding job. Uh, it was a veteran performance uh, by a veteran crew today, and uh, we saw absolutely no, uh, no issues with the, uh, with the uh, rendezvous and docking. Okay, no other questions here in Houston for the moment. Let's go to the phone bridge and start off with Tarek Malik. Thank you very much, uh, Tarek Malik with uh, Space.com. And Mike, you know, I, I just had, a, 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 I guess, a follow-up question to, to Bill there just about the, um, uh, the fly out there, just how, um, how tricky that was for Ken, and then I just had a follow-up question. During the uh, fly out and the final approach today, uh, we fly down a very narrow corridor, uh, and it keeps getting narrower and narrower uh, the closer you get to the International Space Station. It's roughly a degree and a half. Uh, Ken Ham and uh, his crew flew right down the center of the corridor. It was a great approach. Uh, they did have to stop at roughly 30 feet from the International Space Station to verify that the shuttle's docking system was aligned with the International Space Station's docking system. And uh, they did see a little bit of misalignment. There's a, uh, a procedure that we call a fly out that uh, they have the uh, crosshairs on the uh, end of the docking system, and they can see a little bit of roll pitch or yaw misalignment. They did notice a little bit of misalignment, and, and it was a total of one degree. They flew that out at 30, uh, 30 feet from the International Space Station, and once they verified good alignment between the two docking systems, they pressed in, docked, and uh, it was probably the quickest uh, uh, contact to hook closure that I've ever seen. Um, in fact, we were uh, we were kind of kidding about it when we left the control uh, room today. That uh, it was the quickest that we've seen. And some folks were off uh, just gathering a little bit of historical data to see if that was indeed the case. Thank you. And just a, a quick follow-up. You mentioned the um, the images that Tracy uh, snapped from the space station during the um, the pitch maneuver. I'm just kind of curious um, if the hope is now that that will. Um, uh, maybe still allow uh, a clearing of the, the heat shield from launch debris by, I guess, the standard by day six now, or are you uh, expecting maybe to get that uh, um, that uh, sign off um, a day or two later? Thank you. Yeah, it's a little bit too early to tell uh, whether or not the images Tracy took will be able to clear the uh, reinforced carbon-carbon uh, for the areas that we missed yesterday. Uh, the reason is is that the reinforced carbon is the hottest surface on the vehicle. The nose and the wing leading edge are the hottest surface. And uh, the area that we're talking about is on the top side of the wing that uh, doesn't see as much heat as the lower surface or what we call the apex, the, the real uh, curved front edge of the wing. Uh, but there's a real tight tolerance on any damage that we can uh, allow on the reinforced carbon there. And uh, the team will just need to look at the quality of the images from the distance that we took uh, the images from and uh, see if they can meet the resolution requirement. Uh, the hope was that they could meet the requirement and uh, we went ahead and had a crew member added with the uh, highest powered uh, camera that we had, uh, which is a, a 400 millimeter lens with, with a doubler on it. And uh, that uh, the images uh, that I saw were, uh, were great images. Um, I'm not an imagery analyst. I couldn't tell you for sure if it, if it would meet the, uh, the resolution uh, required to clear the vehicle, but uh, we'll just need to give those folks a little bit of time. Okay, next is Marsha Dunn. Marsha? Yes, hi. Um, Mike, I wanted to clarify a couple of things you said um, that was sort of in contrast to the real-time commentary. Um, you mentioned a 16-kilometer missed distance for the debris. Um, the commentator at the time said nine kilometers, and I'm just wanting to clarify because 16 kilometers comes out to about nine miles. I, and, and he also said that there were four space station astronauts taking zoom pictures. Um, T.J. Kramer, I think, was Kramer was one of them too. Do you know? Was it just the three, or were there four space station people taking pictures? 
there were uh, three crew members that took images. One uh, took images, uh, kind of some big picture images with a 400 millimeter lens. Uh, one took zoomed in images with an 800 millimeter lens. And then another one took uh, images of just the top side of the reinforced carbon. Uh, we, we know that for a fact. Uh, there were uh, three imagery cards that were uh, inserted in the laptops and then we downlinked all those. and. Uh, Again, it was three crew members. I can understand where there was some confusion on the mist distance associated with the uh, the piece of space debris that we had. Um, when we were tracking uh, this object over the last couple of days, uh, our criteria to take action to maneuver out of the way of this thing was 10 kilometers. Uh, that's, that's our flight rule constraint. If you think you're going to be within 10 kilometers of a piece of, of debris, you will move out of the way of it. Um, for quite a while, this thing was right on the threshold. It was 12 kilometers and it was nine kilometers. Depending on which uh, source was measuring it, uh, there's a little bit of error associated with that. And uh, it was kind of right on the threshold of, of 10 kilometers. The closest uh, that we saw it was at nine. Um, the closer we get in to the actual, uh, what we call time of closest approach, the TCA, uh, you get better data and uh, the data that we got was showing that our missed distance was 16 kilometers and that's why the uh, debris avoidance maneuver was canceled yesterday and then uh, we confirmed that later today when the uh, the actual uh, time of closest approach occurred about an hour after docking uh, that it was indeed roughly 16 kilometers away from Atlantis and the International Space Station. Thank you and do you have any more idea of what that piece was? No, it's uh, still an unidentified object from an unknown source, and uh, at this point, it's really irrelevant. Uh, it's it's something that's uh, part of a uh, inconsequential history uh, associated with this mission. Question for me: um, When do you expect to decide whether uh, the spacewalkers will tackle that snagged cable, um, and when do you think they'll do it, and what will they need to do? We've got uh, a couple of our uh, spacewalk uh, specialists uh, and engineers out at the Kennedy Space Center uh, as, we, as we speak, uh, assessing what options we have to go uh, manipulate this cable on the uh, pan tilt unit on the end of the uh, shuttle's boom. Uh, they're trying to match the, uh, the exact uh, cable configuration that we have on orbit with some hardware that we have on the ground that's planned to fly on a future mission and then figure out what uh, ways we can either just wire tie this thing or use some Velcro to, to move the cable to a position that won't cause it to interfere, interfere with full uh, motion of the pan tilt unit. Um, we expect to make that decision over the next couple of days. We're not gonna modify anything associated with our first spacewalk uh, tomorrow. Uh, so the earliest that we would ask the, uh, the crew of Atlantis to do anything different associated with this pan tilt unit would be our second spacewalk on flight day six. Um, we're still debating if this task gets added as to whether it would be uh, EVA two on flight day six or EVA three on flight day eight. Uh, all of our uh, spacewalks are full on this mission where we've got full content. And until we either get ahead uh, with the, uh, the mission content that we've got out there or we trade it off against uh, other mission objectives, uh, we're just, uh, hard pressed to find a home for this task. If it is a priority and we know that there's uh, damage on the heat shield of Atlantis, we will indeed go off and, and get our best sensor and our best asset available, uh, the, the, uh, the boom sensor and the pan tilt unit. Uh, but right now uh, we're still trying to determine what if any actions required uh, to, uh, get our, uh, to get all the heat shield cleared. And, and just to follow quickly, and this would be my last question, so for late inspection, if you had to, you could use the backup B method that you used uh, yesterday, would that suffice? Yes, it would, and uh, again, it doesn't cover all of the uh, the heat shield. It, it covers uh, the vast majority of the, of the hottest parts, the reinforced carbon that we inspect for uh, what we call the late inspection, which is to manage or mitigate uh, orbital debris in the orbital debris environment. 
The, uh, the digital camera that uh, we used yesterday provides very high resolution imagery. It's, it, the uh, imagery resolution provided is greater than what we need to inspect for orbital debris. Um, it's just not as an efficient uh, method of gathering that uh, information to clear the heat shield because, again, you need to wait for lighting. In, in, in this case, it's just during sunlight because we don't have the uh, laser dynamic ranging imager, the LDRI, providing an illumination source. That uh, particular illumination source sits on the pan tilt unit, and we weren't able to position it to uh, provide lighting for the digital camera. So uh, it's just a less efficient way to gather uh, the majority of the, uh, the uh, wing leading edge and nose cap uh, data that we need to clear the heat shield for orbital debris at the tail end of the mission. Okay, Mark Corot is up next on the phone bridge. Uh, thanks. I have one question on the uh, the debris piece. Um, I just wonder if if you're done with that, so to speak, for the rest of the mission, or do you have to continue to watch uh, the object to see if it's going to come close to the station in the shuttle? Uh, we went off and asked those questions a couple of days ago, Mark, and uh, right now the object uh, doesn't plan to come near the uh, shuttle Atlantis or the station during the time frame that we're flying this mission. Uh, the orbit is is highly elliptical, and uh, the uh, just the two trajectories aren't going to cross each other uh, for some time, and uh, we're no longer concerned with this particular object. We have a uh, constant screening process in place to monitor for uh, space debris, whether it's man-made or natural, and uh, we'll just continue to use that process. The process works very well, and uh, if, if that object or any other object were to come near either Atlantis or station or both vehicles while they're docked, uh, we'll, we'll use the process and, and potentially uh, maneuver the ships out of the way if required. Okay, next up is Todd Halverson. Uh, thanks, Todd Halverson of uh, Today. And um, I was wondering about the helium uh, regulator uh, problem. Is that in any way uh, similar uh, to the helium pressurization problem that cropped up uh, pre-launch during uh, recent flow? I think, I think it even might have been 130. Uh, we did have uh, helium reg problems on uh, STS-131 uh, leading up to it, and we had to uh, do some additional work to provide uh, flight rationale. Um, that was on the, uh, the reaction control system uh, thruster uh, tanks. This was on the orbital maneuvering system tanks, uh, the problem that we saw today. Uh, they're unrelated. Uh, what we believe we saw today was just the, uh, the tank pressure was a little bit lower than we normally see, and when we opened the isolation valve, the, the regulator just kind of uh, let loose a little bit uh, longer than we normally uh, see it and uh, caused a little bit higher pressure spike than, uh, than uh, what we would normally expect from uh, this particular regulator. There's a, a primary and a secondary regulator. They control the slightly different pressures, and when uh, the, the primary regulator, if it's working, will control to a slightly lower pressure. And what we saw was uh, roughly 10 PSI higher than uh, what we would expect. And it could have either been uh, a reg that kind of just uh, creep creeped on us a little bit, or it could have been uh, the secondary regular controlling only, and, and the primary regular wasn't in the path, in the path of uh, controlling the pressure of this particular uh, system. Um, we've got a little bit of data from uh, previous flights and, and previous missions where we've seen performance similar to this, and folks are off comparing that. Um, again, it's, it's not of any consequence to this mission. Folks uh, are comfortable using that system, um, which now we've got is, is the backup system or the system that we've got for any future uh, uses of this engine uh, to uh, raise or lower uh, Atlantis's orbit. Uh, thanks very much. And, and in regards to uh, EVA number one, I'm wondering if you could uh, give us an idea of relative degree of difficulty of this particular spacewalk and, and what you believe the biggest challenges uh, might be? Uh, the biggest challenge is simply just going to be time. Uh, if we can get all the uh, planned tasks done within the time allotted, 
Uh, you know, we've got uh, six and a half hours of uh, time set aside for, for both of our spacewalkers, Steve Bone and Garrett Reisman, uh, while they're outside uh, performing our first spacewalk. The tasks that we're performing on this mission, uh, this will be the first time that we've done those types of tasks, so there's a little bit greater uncertainty as to uh, how long they're actually going to take. Uh, we've trained these uh, tasks a bunch of times in the uh, Nutribuoyancy Lab here in Houston, and uh, we have a lot of good uh, information about uh, choreography and the most efficient way to perform these tasks. Uh, it's just a little bit uncertain as to once we finally get on orbit, uh, you're outside for the first spacewalk and you're dealing with the real hardware, uh, how long it's going to take. Uh, up until this point, uh, we've just been using training models on the ground and actually seen the real hardware at the Kennedy Space Center. Uh, but uh, when you finally put hands on the real hardware uh, on the real day, uh, for a task that you've not performed, uh, it, it, there's just a little bit greater uncertainty. Uh, so it's just, uh, again, a matter of time. The, uh, the batteries that we plan to remove and replace, we've done that before. Uh, specifically on the STS-127 mission, we replaced uh, six batteries. Uh, if you recall, we had a little bit of difficulty uh, getting the batteries removed and replaced, uh, and time was an element, but we've learned from that, and uh, we can use that as leverage to make uh, our second and third spacewalk a little more efficient. Uh, this first one, uh, we're doing two uh, first-time tasks, and uh, there's just, again, a little bit more uncertainty. Um, you mentioned earlier that uh, you expected some spectacular views uh, from uh, Garrett uh, Reisman's uh, trip uh, tomorrow on the robot arm. I'm wondering if you can kind of paint a word picture for us and uh, give me an idea of where he's going to be and what he's going to be seeing. Yeah, uh, Garrett is basically going to ride the uh, shuttle's arm uh, from the uh, position of the cargo carrier, and he's going to pick up pieces of the uh, antenna and then basically ride the arm across the top of station, and the shuttle will be parked in front. And uh, he'll just get a, a God's eye view of the International Space Station and uh, Atlantis uh, as he flies over with these uh, pieces of the uh, communications antenna. And then when he comes back over, uh, he won't have anything in his hands. And boy, if I were him, I'd, uh, I'd grab a few snapshots of that moment. Um, with any luck, it'll be during the daytime. Uh, we're not obviously planning the mission around uh, whether or not it's day or night uh, during that particular portion of the spacewalk, but uh, I'm, I'm sure that it'll be spectacular. And just the last one for me has to do with your uh, cryo margins. Uh, I think I heard a report early on in your shift today that there, you had one day in five hours, and I'm wondering if uh, that is the case and whether that would be enough to uh, take an extension day if you, for some reason, needed to. Yes, uh, as far as the... Uh Cryo and the consumables margin for this mission, we do have an extra day available. Um, a lot of that was basically because we launched on time. Uh, we load extra consumables uh, for the cryogenic systems to uh, support what we call pad holds, so we don't have to continue to, to uh, load up the, uh, the cryogenic oxygen and hydrogen tanks to supply power to the fuel cells. Uh, for sitting on the launch pad due to weather or any other circumstance. And uh, we launched on time, so we used all that pad hold margin, uh, and we took it to orbit with us. Um, and uh, we've got in excess of a day. It's uh, one day and five hours. And uh, right now, that's just margin in our pocket. Uh, we'll use it for any number of reasons if it's required for high priority uh, reasons, whether that's uh, to uh, mitigate problems with either Atlantis or the International Space Station or to manage problems with any of the planned spacewalks. It's a little premature to give that margin to anything uh, just because uh, we've got a lot of mission ahead of us. We've got all three spacewalks. We've got installation of ROSVET. We've got to return the integrated cargo carrier uh, to the shuttle's payload bay for return. And uh, we've just got uh, the vast majority of the primary mission objectives ahead of us. And uh, we're just, again, carrying that uh, in case we need it later. Uh, right now, there's no plan to extend the mission, uh, but uh, we'll look for uh, direction from the mission management team or any other uh, parties should we need to uh, extend the mission, and uh, we'll talk about that as necessary. That's it for me. Thanks very much. Okay, and finally on the phone bridge, Charles Atkinson. Good afternoon. Charles Atkinson with SpaceLaunchNews.com. Mike, I was wondering if you could describe how delicate it will be for the station's arm to install the ICC onto the transporter. And uh, what steps are uh, then performed to latch it down initially? 
The uh, cargo carrier that we're carrying up has uh, two grapple fixtures, and uh, the first we'll use to uh, pull it out of the shuttle's payload bay with the uh, station's robotic arm, and then we'll uh, position it over on the, uh, the mobile transporter, and here you can see an animation of it being pulled out of the payload bay. Um, I wouldn't say that the uh, robotic operation is any more complex uh, than what we've done in the past. Again, we did something very similar to this on STS-127. Um, it does require uh, some precision. You have to thread it through the uh, space station structure between the uh, Japanese experiment module and the mobile and the uh, and the uh, main truss system on there to find the mobile transporter. And then once you locate it to the mobile transporter, there's a, another grapple fixture on that, and it'll close a set of snares uh, on, the, uh, on the extra grapple fixture. And then once we've confirmed that the snares are closed on the mobile transporter, we'll ungrapple the uh, station's robotic arm and back it off. Um, it is a uh, precision operation. It does require a, a lot of training, and uh, we've got the right folks uh, on board Atlantis and the International Space Station to do it, um, but uh, again, it's uh, it's somewhat familiar territory to what we've done. It's not to uh, to downplay uh, how complex an operation it is. It's just uh, something that uh, we've seen and done before. Okay, thanks. And one last one, uh, changing course here. On Wednesday will be the JSC NASA tweet up, and uh, with this busy mission unfolding, will you be checking your own Twitter feed uh, for what the space tweets will be noting on this flight? Uh, during the mission, uh, I, uh, I find it hard to have excess time to do much of anything other than uh, come in, support the mission, uh, do briefings like this, and then uh, go home and get enough sleep to come back and do it again the next day. So uh, the short answer is no, I'm not going to uh, join the, uh, the Twitterverse out there. Okay, thank you. Okay, back here in Houston, I don't believe we have any follow-up questions, so with the ICC uh, cargo carrier operation in progress, we'll call it a briefing. A couple of programming notes before we close. Our next briefing on NASA television is right around the corner at 3 p.m. Central Time, 4 p.m. Eastern Time with Leroy Kane, the Deputy Space Shuttle Program Manager and Chairman of the Mission Management Team, following today's daily meeting of the MMT that is going on as we speak. Atlantis's crew begins its sleep period at uh, 6.20 p.m. Central Time tonight. We will air our flight day highlights right after that at 7 p.m. Central Time with all of that spectacular video from today's rendezvous and docking operations. The highlights will be broadcast every hour on the hour throughout the crew's sleep period. Our first ISS Flight Director update interview from console with Space Station Flight Director Scott Stover is scheduled late tonight at 11.30 p.m. Central Time. And then in the wee hours on Monday, Atlantis's crew will be awakened at 2.20 a.m. Central Time to gear up for the first spacewalk of the mission. That spacewalk is scheduled to begin at about 7.15 a.m. Central Time Monday morning or earlier if Garrett Reisman and Steve Bowen are running ahead of schedule. You can follow all of the activities of the shuttle and station crews on our website at www.nasa.gov. Well, that will, with that, we'll wrap up the briefing, go back to mission control, and continuing coverage of the STS-132 mission. Thanks very much.